Matthew chapter 19 this morning. That's going to be our spiritual meal. Chapter Matthew chapter 19. Uh, while you are turning there, uh, Matthew chapter 19, let me tell you a quick story. It was uh, 1990, and um, I was a young man, and uh, I had a set of uh, Star Wars VHS tapes, right? It's my prized possession. They were a gold box set. And a buddy of mine said, hey, can I borrow those? I said, absolutely. Whatever you do, though, don't break them, right? So sure enough, a week later, he comes back to me. He's like, hey, here's the box. It's ripped open. He's like, one of, my one of the tapes got caught in my VHS player. For those of you who are kids and don't know what VHS is, ask your parents. But anyways, and it ate the tape up, and it was completely gone. And I was like, I lent this to you. I trusted this to you. And it was my first experience of having my trust broken. But here's where I want to, to get with this idea, and that is that for all of us, we've all, we all lend things out to people. We have to extend a certain amount of trust to others just to survive, just to thrive, just to do life. And so I was thinking about all the different things that we entrust to people. For many of us who are parents here today, we entrust our kids. Um, whether it's to uh, a babysitter, whether it's to a school, whether it's to friends or family, um, we, we, we trust our kids to them. The, our, their safety, their emotional health, their nutrition, their overall well-being. When we uh, are, go are going out for the night and we have a babysitter, we're, we're trusting our kids to them. Um, for some of you, maybe you, you've had this experience. If your kids are uh, fully grown, I know uh, of a father who his uh, daughter asked if she could borrow his truck to go out for the night. He allowed her to borrow the truck, and as she was pulling it out of the driveway, she tore off like half of the side of it because she ran it into something, right? So we've all had this experience of maybe loaning or lending something to someone, hoping that they, they, they'll be entrusted to care for it well, and perhaps uh, it hasn't worked out the way we were thinking. Now, the reason that I kind of present that is because here's what I want you us to get our mind around this morning as we enter into the text, and that is um, uh, the truth of Psalm 24, 1. It says, the earth is the Lord's in everything in it, the world in all who live in it. So if you're a note taker this morning, kind of our big idea that we're going to look at is this, everything we have is a gift from God for us to manage for a short season. So we have been lended. Our bodies, our minds, our families, our opportunities, our education, our, our, our life stage and age. It's all a gift from God for us to steward for a short season. And we're going to get real personal this morning. We're going to look at some things that are near and dear to all of our hearts. So I want to look at four good gifts that God gives. And I want to ask the simple question, how are we doing? How are we doing at managing the gifts that God gives to us? So again, if you're a note taker or maybe you're in a community group, you like to track through so you can teach it yourself or reiterate it or think it through. We'll look at four good gifts that God gives us. The first is marriage, which will be verses 1 through 9. The second is singleness, which will be verses 10 through 12. The third is kids, which will be verses 13 through 15. And then the fourth is stuff. Just stuff, which will be uh, verses 16 through 30. So lots to look at here. Let's pray and ask for the Lord's help as we get started. Father, we come before you today and we recognize, Lord, that we are merely stewards of everything we have. Our life, our breath, our finances, our education, the minds you've given us. Help us, Lord, to steward all of these things well for your glory and for the good of others. God, as we enter into your scriptures, Lord, we enter into holy ground. The very voice and word of God, may we tremble. Lord, we're encountering you through your word. We're encountering your son, the risen reigning Jesus. God, may we not take these things lightly. May we receive what you have for us, Lord. I pray, God, for the variety of needs out as I look out on this church body, Lord. There are those who need encouragement. There are those who need correction. There are those who need strengthening. There are those who need a word from you today. So, God, we ask that you would do more than we could hope or imagine. In the name of Jesus, all God's people said, 
Amen, amen, amen. All right, so the gift of marriage, here we go. Show of hands. How many of you are married right now by show of hands? How many of you are married? Okay. How many of you would like to be married by show of hands? All right? All right, okay. Okay, all right, all right. Well, statistically, 90% of you will be married at some point in your life. So if this doesn't imply to you right now, it will potentially at some point, right? Many of us have been given this incredible gift of marriage uh, from God for us to manage, to steward it for a season, right? And marriage, as many of us know and realize, is a central human relationship. Therefore, it is in marriage that for those of us who are married, we find some of our greatest joys, some of our greatest challenges, some of our deepest sorrows. And Jesus is going to be asked about marriage in divorce this morning. So just, just to preface this, I want to um, be really careful because I know that there is no one in this room that has not in some way been affected by divorce. Um, I know that it can be very deeply painful, deeply wounding. And I know that for many of you, this is a, a situation that you've either walked through yourself or maybe your family or friends. There's no one in this room that, that divorce has not personally affected. And so being aware and prefacing that, I want us to get started. Look what it says in verse 1 of chapter 19. It says, now when Jesus had finished saying these things, that's our, our last chapter. You're welcome. Uh, if you want to check out the podcast, uh, you can go back to that. But he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And a large crowd followed him and he healed them all. Jesus is who we love, who we follow, who we listen to. At Rainier Valley Church, we want to be all about Jesus, his word, his example, his life, his death on the cross. And I love here, it says that he healed all who come to him. That's why we come to Jesus. We experience his life, his healing, his renewal, his goodness. Now, Jesus was so controversial in his time. He had a group of folks that did not like him much. We've seen this throughout the gospel. They are the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders. And we've seen engagement, disengagement, engagement, disengagement. And it's ratcheted up to the point where we know that when it says Pharisees, these folks are plotting. They're strategizing. How do we kill Jesus? They want to get rid of him. So don't assume good intentions when you hear Pharisees at this point. Verse 3, and the Pharisees came up and tested him. This isn't a genuine question. This isn't a desire to learn. There's no humility in this. This is a trap. They're testing him. They say, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Trust me, being in ministry for 10 years, when somebody starts bringing up the issue of divorce, right, you hear ominous music in the background. No, it doesn't matter what you say or what you do or where you land. This is a controversial issue. And you know that the Pharisees had thought this through. Jesus is growing in popularity. He's uniting people that would regularly not walk together in love and life. And so they say, you know what? How we can bring him down, how we can take him down a peg, how we can divide his crowd. Let's ask him this question. Is it lawful? to divorce one's wife for any reason. They're referring um, uh, to Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. We won't go there now, but you're welcome to do that in your own study. Essentially, Moses outlines in the Mosaic Law the means of divorce, and he uses a term that's somewhat ambiguous. So depending on what translation you have, it'll say something along the lines of if the husband finds any indecency in his wife. And so this popular term was uh, a matter of debate, especially in the first century. And there were two rabbinical schools um, that, that fell in completely sort of opposite ends of this. The, the conservative uh, rabbinical school of uh, Shammai uh, viewed the indecency referred to in Deuteronomy as only adultery. Um, a sexual union outside of the marriage covenant. And then the, the, the liberal rabbinical school called Hillel uh, reasoned that it could essentially be anything, anything that was indecent, that, that would separate. And, and Hillel's school was, was actually the, the, the popular school at the time. Um, and so what we see is there's this ongoing debate then between these two schools. And so this is a sensitive and, and divisive issue. What is the means by which a couple can become divorced? And again, I just want to preface, I, I know that this is personally affecting many of you. And, and what I want to say, and this should go without saying, is that um, God's heart, God hates divorce. 
Um, divorce is, uh, one scholar said it this way, divorce, every single divorce is the collapse of a small civilization. This is a very, very big deal. Divorce is devastating, and I know many of us have walked through it, so this is not merely theoretical. Verse 4, he answered them. Jesus now is faced with this question. Everyone's watching. The heat is on. And he answers them and says, have you not read, which is kind of a, a funny little jab to those whose whole job is to read the Torah. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning... So Jesus is jumping over Deuteronomy and going all the way back to the beginning. He's going back to creation and the creation mandate, the creation normatives in Genesis 1 and 2. He who made them from the beginning made them male and female. And he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. Jesus is quoting the Old Testament verbatim. And he's saying what marriage looks like, the dynamic and the means and the design that God created for marriage is this infusing of two souls together. The Hebrew word is, is dod, which li literally you could translate the mingling of souls. It's that the two become one socially, spiritually, relationally, sexually. That is what the marriage covenant is. And so therefore Jesus says, so that they are no longer two, but one. God sees a unity, a bonding, a oneness, a family unit. What therefore God has joined together. So Jesus is saying that marriage is not just the person that you met on you know, eHarmony or Christian Mingle, that you happen to run into, that a friend introduced you to, blah, 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 and so on. That providentially over all of that, if you are married, God has intended that person for you. Providentially, that person, you are unified in a covenant that God has created. So it says, they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. This is a huge deal. This is the biggest and most important relationship of our entire lives. It's by this relationship that kids are brought into the world and brought up in the world. And we see in God's creation design the majesty, the beauty of God's creativity of designing male and female. We see the intent of God in making male and female for marriage, which is a loving, sexual, sacrificial, lifelong covenant between a man and a woman. And at this point, I, I feel compelled to say, I would argue, and, and it, marriage is, is becoming very cheap in our culture. So what I want you to point you from is away from what we could call civil marriage, and I want to point you to what the scripture calls covenantal marriage. The lifelong union of one man and one woman. And this is why it's interesting, um, having been in ministry for as long as I have, I've, I've uh, had the opportunity to officiate many, many, many weddings. And one of the things that, apart from everything else, one of the things that I often try to, to do with couples is I ask them not to write their own vows. Because that can be just really, really, really cheesy and flippant. And what I want them to see is that when they're coming together, yes, it is them, and, 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 and oftentimes they'll hear, oh, this day is about you, and you know, it, it's all about you, and, and you know, your tastes and your preferences, and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, sure, that's fine. You can have the cake you want, and so on and so forth. But when you stand in front of your family and friends, and you publicly declare and covenant and make those solemn vows. That is a holy and weighty thing. And I've stood before many couples and they have looked at me and then at one another and they have pledged in front of everyone in a public ceremony saying, admitting that, hey, the romance and the infatuation isn't always going to be here. And I'm not always probably going to feel the way I feel in this moment. Which is why they say things like forsaking all others. That's why they say things like, for better or worse, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. By their own confession and the will of God, they are limiting, they are limiting the opt-out clause. And so Jesus says, or rather they say to Jesus, okay, well, if there's this beauty in design and design and creation, um, but divorce is prevalent, the Hillel school is most influential, and we've all experienced it. They, say then, they said to him, verse 7, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? 
And he said to them in response, because, you know, they're, they're, being, they're being good Pharisees, right? They're following up. Well, wait a minute, you didn't actually engage the Deuteronomy thing. You jumped over it and went to Genesis. And then so he says to them in verse 8, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. So much happening here in Christian ethics, I can't even remotely get into it. But I will just say this, divorce was allowed because of the hardness of heart. It's allowed, not required. It's permitted, not commanded. They may, not they must. And what Jesus is doing in saying this is he's saying the Mosaic law isn't ideal. It's not the standard we look to. The standard we look to is creation. Because in the Mosaic Law, and what I often find is people are talking about, is there a biblical grounds for this divorce? Did they do this? And what the creation design and Jesus is talking about is covenant, unrelenting covenantal love. I will stay with you no matter what, through thick and thin, through good times and through hard times, through better or worse in sickness and in health. I'm not going anywhere. And for many, that hasn't been the promise that they've kept. But here's the good news this morning. That is the covenantal faithfulness of God's heart for you and I. He is not going anywhere. And you might think, but what have I done? And if he only knew my past you know, marriages and, and my divorces and my frustrations and the sin I've committed and the backsliding I've done... And God's covenant with us is based on the blood of Jesus, not on your own righteousness, not on how well you've cleaned yourself up, not on how well you stopped sinning. He is here and he is with you by faith because of Jesus' death, no matter what, he's not going anywhere. That's God's covenantal faithfulness and love. Now, back to the hard word from Jesus, verse 9, here we go. Jesus says this, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality, that's the Greek word porneia, and marries another commits adultery. Commits adultery. Okay, so let me unpack this briefly. There are, there are biblical permissions for divorce, such as adultery and then the abandonment from an unbelieving spouse in 1 Corinthians 7. Those are the means or the, the grounds that dissolve the covenant. And I think one of the reasons why divorce has become so prevalent is because sexual intimacy has become so cheap. And in the scriptural view, you should be chaste before marriage. You should marry one person. This is all the ideal. And that person you, and you shall live together in covenantal faithfulness for a lifetime. And so what we find is that the scripture talks about covenant and sexual union as going hand in hand. And so when there's a sexual union outside the covenant, it dissolves or breaks the covenant. Or at least as the, 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 the partner who's offended can step out of that covenant. So here's what I would, here's what I would call you to. If you this morning are considering divorce on any other grounds apart from infidelity, I would plead with you to reconsider based on the authority of the creation in the word of God. If you want to divorce because you feel like you've fallen out of love, you've drifted apart, you have communication issues, you don't feel that sense of romance or affection anymore, I would beg of you to reconsider, I would encourage you to keep the covenant of your youth, to seek counsel, to reconcile, to work towards staying together for the glory of God and the good of those who are watching. Be reconciled to one another. Do not give up the most important blessing you can possibly experience in this world. And I get when saying that, there are some that are so embittered. There has been years and years and years and years and years of being sinned against. And here's what I would say. I'm not saying to, di I'm not diminishing those things. I'm not saying that there is not serious help 
that you need. And there's not things that have to change. But what I am saying is that even in the midst of all that, it is not grounds for divorce. And here is the thing, and I want to say this graciously. Every situation is different. And if you need counsel, please speak with me or one of uh, our other pastors, Pastor Steve or Pastor Nate. We'd love to talk with you. We'd love to counsel you. We'd love to pray for you. But don't do anything until you've received counsel. Do not make a sharp or rash decision. And then if you're here this morning and you have been divorced, I just want to say to you directly, you are not a second class citizen. You're welcome here. Grace abounds. And if you feel like you're a second class citizen, then I, I, I think my encouragement is please understand the tension that the body of Christ feels where our Lord and Savior has elevated the marriage covenant to a very high level. And so what we want to do is protect that. And so if you're here and you have been sinned against and you have biblical grounds and you've been divorced and you feel like a second class citizen, I'd say you are loved, you are cared for, and you are accepted. And if anyone treats you otherwise, I, on, on, on behalf of me and the elders, I'm sorry. We love you and we're grateful that you are here. Here's what I see in this passage that I want to um, highlight. I want to take this passage as a warning for those of you in here who are married. I want to coach the marriages in this room because they're incredibly important. So here's some practical boots on the ground advice. You guys ready? Okay, first, manage your momentum. Every marriage has a sense of momentum. And what I've seen, and me and my wife uh, have seen in our council of couples and in our own lives as well, is that this momentum goes two ways. You're either in an energizing cycle where you're moving towards one another or you are moving away from one another. But what I want you to see is in your marriage, there is no neutral ground. Apathy will rot your marriage. If you say, oh, everything's fine. I think they love me. They said it one time. Apathy will rot your marriage. So let me give you some defensive and offensive strategies. The first is defensive strategies, right? In your, ma in your marriage, rather, manage your fights. Manage your fights. A successful, healthy, joyful marriage always has to learn the principle of how to fight fair. And, and then what's interesting is that when we counsel folks, there's really kind of two, there's two stages. There's some people that just love fighting, right? Oh, let me in there. You know, I love to argue. I love to debate. I love to, I love to be right, right? And this took me probably three, maybe four years in my marriage to realize. But it turns out that you can win an argument and really lose, right? What did you actually win? He, see, here's the interesting thing. The goal of any healthy conflict isn't victory, but unity. The goal of any healthy conflict isn't victory but unity. Some people in marriages just avoid fighting altogether, avoid conflict altogether. I can hide in my marriage and away from my spouse, but then nothing ends up getting resolved. Here's what I would tell you. If that tends to be your tendency, I want you to receive this word. A lack of conflict isn't an indicator of a healthy marriage. It could be an indicator of a dysfunctional one. If you never seek resolution and you never seek to have your opinion heard and, and there's not good give and take, that might not be a healthy relationship. The goal isn't avoidance, but reconciliation. The goal isn't avoidance, but reconciliation. All right, some pillars to fighting fair for my married couples out there. Here's a couple for you, all right? The first is oneness. Oneness, the goal in any conflict, when you fall out of out of unity, when there's tension and when there's arguments and when there's frustration, the goal of every conflict isn't just a resolution, but it's a reconciliation. It isn't just to have something settled, but to come together again, to be one in all things. Uh, in a conflict, here's a great uh, practical advice, no absolutes. No absolutes. What I see oftentimes in marriages is, well, he never, well, she always, well, this, la, 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 and so on. And here's what I would tell you. If this is a Christian covenantal marriage with two people filled with the power and presence of God through the Holy Spirit, then, I, then you, you don't use absolute statements because the Holy Spirit is faithful to continue to transform your spouse. In fact, they'll do a better job than you will. It, he will do a better job than you will. I love the way uh, Philippians 1.6 says it. Uh, essentially, it is to believe the best, that God, that the best is yet to come. 
That God is at work in us. Here, let me give you one other one. In a fight, to fight fair, to fight well, to have healthy conflict resolution, is forgiveness is free. And I did originally say final, but as I've interacted with people, I, I think the more healthy way of saying it is forgiveness is free and ongoing. Forgiveness is free and ongoing in a marriage. As Christians, we have been given forgiven of all of our sins by Christ. His death on the cross has forgiven us. We are to be a people of forgiveness. We do not withhold forgiveness. That only leads to bitterness and we continue to be upset about past sins and have this, you know, if any marriage has an ongoing record of everything that's happened in the past, you're going to find that the future looks a lot like the past. Forgiveness is free and ongoing. All right, now a couple more strategies. Here's some offensive strategies. Manage your fights defensively. Manage your friendship offensively. A successful, healthy, joyful marriage is between two best friends who enjoy one another and have a lot of fun together as well. So simple things. Practice a date night. If you do not cultivate romance, you will functionally become roommates. Getting things done is fine, but you also need that face-to-face -face time where you're looking into one another's eyes, where you're stepping out of all the, the to-dos to just be and to be together. This might include turning off your smartphone. This might include getting out of the house and away from the kids. This might include paying for a babysitter and trusting someone enough to watch your kiddos because this is a priority. You are not just parents. You are still lovers and friends. And that needs to be cultivated. So practice a date night. Also share a hobby. So if a date night is face to face, hobby is shoulder to shoulder. I see some of the strongest marriages are, are marriages where, where the, the partners have a hobby. They go dancing. They play a sport. They learn a language. They do a home improvement project together. Working together. Spending time together. Enjoying one another together. Another, another practical thing, many of you are familiar with this, there's a great book um, uh, on love languages, how we uh, give and receive love. And if you are married, you probably have already read that book, and if you haven't, there's your assignment, or at least a you know, blog that, uh, that articulates it. But know your spouse's love language. How do they receive love? How do they feel cared for? How do they feel admired and respected and appreciated? And, and just simple things, like keep a running list of all the things that you know, they've talked about that they need or they want. How can you bless them? And then finally, uh, grow together. In marriage, those marriages that are intentional are the ones that not just last, but are, stay healthy and joyful. It's been interesting in, in uh, me and Crystal's time uh, together as we've sought counsel from others, um, we've heard things that are, that are very helpful. Things like you can't do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. And too often that's the case in marriage. So how are you being challenged? How are you being provoked to love and good works? How are you growing in your marriage? We, um, there was a couple that was mentoring us for many years. Um, and one of the things we deeply respected about them is every year they would read through a marriage book together. They would go to marriage retreats. They put their marriage as a priority even over their kids. And it's interesting because the question that I think oftentimes married couples miss is like, how are we growing together? Here's a simple one for you. Can you guys, in your marriages, do you regularly take time to pray together? Do you regularly take time to pray together? If you want to know the other person, you want to know what's deepest and most important in your heart, you want to know their authentic, uncut, real relationship with God, pray together. And you know what's fascinating to me? I've counseled many couples that are able to be intimate in every other way, but spiritually. Because there's something so transparent about praying together that it's uncomfortable. Pray together. Invest in your marriage. Grow together. Marriage is a gift from God to steward for a short season. How are we doing? Next up, God's gift of singleness. So how many in this room, by show of hands, are single? 
If you, yeah, okay, great. All right, this is for you guys. Um, according to a statistic, there are 86 million single Americans right now, and the number is growing. In 1970, there were only about 36% adults that were unmarried, and today it's actually over 50%. And so um, you'll spend more of your adult life statistically single than you will marry. So what we do in our single years and how we understand and use our singleness matters. Look what the disciples say after hearing this high and hard word about marriage. Look what they say. Verse 10. The disciples said to Jesus, If this is the case of a man and his wife, is it better not to marry? And Jesus said to them, <laughs> I think someone just said yes there. I love it. Uh, and he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, clearly, but only those to whom it is given. So marriage is not for everyone. Look what he says. Here's some specific folks that marriage is not for. He says, for there are eunuchs who have been born or have been so from birth. Now, we have little kids in the room, so I won't unpack what a eunuch is. <laughs> And since I said it now multiple times and somebody asks you, sorry parents, you you got to take that one, all right? Take one for the team. So there are those who are, are eunuchs and have been so from birth. There are those who are eunuchs and have been made eunuchs by men. And there are those who are eunuchs and have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive this. Notice he says the same thing about marriage and singleness. Let those who are able receive it. The place that you are in, do you receive it as a gift from God? Let me give you a couple things for those of you who are single. First, singleness is a gift from God. Singleness is a gift from God. We must resist, as a church culture, we must resist the, the implication that singleness is somehow second best. The Bible does not say so. Marriage is good, and so is singleness. Did you know that? It has been given to some, Jesus says, to be single. And singles oftentimes, and I hope this is not the case here at Rainier Valley Church, but I've, I've been around uh, multiple churches and know that this can be a culture and a tension. Oftentimes, singleness is feel a tremendous amount of pressure in the church. Well, are you seeing anyone yet? Are you still single? Have you gone out with anybody? How are you doing? As though their whole life can be reduced to the romantic portion and the romantic element. What if, and, and some of you, when you hear, okay, I need to say this. This is very important. Some of you, when you hear this idea of the gift of singleness, you're like, what? You're like, wait a second. Like, I don't find this easy, okay? I don't like being single. I would very much like to be married. I long to be married. I long to be married. Maybe I don't have the gift. Do I not have the gift if I'm feeling a desire to want to be married? And, and what I would want to say is that fundamentally, I think in the church, we've really mishandled this. We've, we've really mishandled this, right? When Paul speaks of singleness as a gift, he isn't speaking of a particular ability some people have. Sort of a supernatural contentedness. I'm single, man. Dun, 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 dun. I never struggle with wanting the desire to be married. When Paul, in the context of 1 Corinthians 6 and 7, is talking about this, he's speaking of the state of being single. The state of being single. As long as you are single, as long as you have this state, it's a gift from God. It is a gift from God. And what, what I think is interesting is that um, sometimes people think that if I'm called to be single, and, and I, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean you always find it easy to be single. It doesn't mean you always find it in, easy to be single. Don't confuse the gift with ease. Being called to be married isn't always easy as well. The season and the stage that you find yourself in is a gift from God. We ought to recognize it and use it as such. Other thoughts. Singleness has its advantages. So Paul mentions two advantages for our single folks this morning. 1 Corinthians 7 talks about single people are spared what Paul terms the troubles of marriage. The troubles of marriage. There are many great blessings in marriage and there are many great difficulties too. Understandably, Christian couples don't often uh, talk openly about some of the hard things they face. 
And so what I find is that oftentimes uh, singles, especially singles in the church, have sort of these rose-tinted glasses about what being married is like. I can remember my wife was in a, a group of, uh, of gals. They were doing a Bible study. There was a lot of single gals there. And she shared something on her heart. I forget the, the context of it. And one of the gals, bless her heart, she turns to my wife and she says, but you're married. I thought everything is great after you're married. And I think, I think if I recall correctly, she shared something about struggling with, it was a busy season, I was off and out and about, and she struggled with feeling lonely. And this gal said, but I thought once you get married, you never feel lonely. Not the case. Single people are spared the troubles of marriage. Also, Paul writes, single people can devote themselves more fully to God's work. 1 Corinthians 7, 32-34, An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of the world, how he can please his wife. His interests are divided. If you're a single person out there and you're like, I don't feel like uh, I can more fully devote myself to the work of the Lord, I'll say, yes, you can. You do not have to worry about the diaper bag, about getting kids home for their naps, about them melting down after a certain stage at night. You are so free in this season to minister, to stay out late, to pray for people, to show up early and serve. Do you see the season you're in as a blessing and a gift? Are you utilizing and leveraging it well? So we ought to shift our focus from the difficulties to the benefits. And that goes for married in single folks as well. I love the way, though, singleness is a witness to the church, and it speaks of radical dependence on God. Uh, Henry Newman said it this way, In singleness, God will be more readily recognized as a source of power in our lives. Thomas Aquinas spoke of it this way, Singleness is a vacancy for God. In singleness... It teaches the, watch, the watching world that true dependence lies in God alone and not merely in a spouse. And then point number three, and I'll try and speed this up a little bit. Singleness is hard. Singleness is hard for my single brothers and sisters out there. When God saw Adam on his own in the garden, he said, it's not good that man should be alone. So he created Eve to meet Adam's need for companionship. The two came together in a lifelong sexual relationship of marriage. And what's interesting is, although the New Testament is positive about singleness, there's no doubt that marriage is actually regarded as the norm. And statistically, 90% of you will marry at some point in your life. So it is God's loving gift to humanity in the chief context, the exclusive context by which the desires for sexual intimacy are to be met. They are sanctioned by God. So therefore, singles are likely to struggle with loneliness and sexual temptation. That is the unique challenge of singleness, as marriage has its own unique challenges. And those struggles are certainly not exclusive to the unmarried, but they are very much a part of the single condition. So, if you are single, here's my concern. Here's my call to you. How do you prevent the idea of marriage from becoming an idol in your life? An obsession, a singular focus that all of your hope, all of your desire is on being married. And here is, is what I would, I would call you to or maybe just even remind you of. Your relational status, whether single or married, will never answer the deepest longing of your heart. And I try and say this, every marriage I, I, I officiate I try to say, like, what we see here and the love that we see here is a reflection of the greater love of Christ and His church. And as much as we enjoy this wedding, we're waiting for the greater wedding. This is a picture, a metaphor, a billboard, an appetizer. The reality, though, is in Christ. Our hearts are restless until they find rest in Him. And one of the great false gospels of our time is that if you can just meet someone you can experience that apocalyptic romance where they will fill every longing of your heart and they will make you feel so good. And the, 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 the tragedy of that is that for those who buy into that lie, what they end up doing is finding themselves discontented in their relationship and absolutely exhausting their spouse because they are putting on them a godlike weight. So if you are single and you're here this morning, manage your singleness well by not idolizing the gift of marriage. 
<laughs> Marriage is only a pointer, a metaphor, and a shadow. Jesus answered them, you are wrong because you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, that's where all this is headed. People will neither marry nor are given in marriage, but will be like the angels in heaven. What this means for us, single and married, is that your essence, the deepest and truest part of who you are, is not a husband or a wife. Your very essence, at the end of days, there is only the marriage between Jesus and the church. And singleness reminds us that our truest, realest, deepest identity is not husband or wife, but rather child of God. Child of God. So, let's go to the next one. God's gift of children. If we are called to manage all of the blessings He has given us, whether married or single, for a short season, we are also called, for what seems like an incredibly short season, to manage the blessing many of us have been given of kids. So look what Jesus says, verse 19, or excuse me, chapter 19, verse 13. It says, Then children were brought to him, and he laid his hands on them, and he prayed, and the disciples rebuked them, right? We've been here before, and the disciples still aren't getting it. The disciples are turning away the kids. Kids are gross, right? They got boogers and snot and they're loud and obnoxious and there's poopy diapers and they're not spiritual. They haven't made it, right? This is for adults. This is for grown-ups. This is for people who can cogitate. Spirituality is not for kids. At least that's what the disciples thought. Kids are lesser. There's no sentimentality in, in ancient culture. And look what Jesus says. He, Jesus' example of life and ministry is the reason why we hold kids the way we do in our culture. Jesus said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. Don't hinder kids from hearing the gospel, from reading the Bible, from praying, from beginning to understand God. Kids are capable of so much. We radically underestimate a child's ability to follow after Jesus. Kids get it. Do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them, and then he went away. It's a beautiful picture of Jesus blessing and praying for kids. And here's what I would ask us. What is our view of kids, Rainier Valley Church? What is our view of kids? I think in our culture, we live in a world now of two extremes. The first, I'll say, is almost like the suburban extreme, right? And it's that kids are the center. Kids are absolutely everything. Kids are what gives your life meaning and purpose and joy. And that's why if you're ever traveling around the suburbs, right, and you see all the franchises everywhere in the strip malls, you'll notice all these signs say things like family friendly, family this, family that, family idolatry, right? It's all about the kids. Thanksgiving and Christmas, ah, it might have something to do with Jesus, but it's mostly family, right? Everything is family. We base our whole lives around our kids' ballet schedule and soccer practice and basketball and, 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 and track and field and friends and, and hobbies. And our kids are the center. And that can be extremely dangerous. Because the scripture says we're to bring kids up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Use the old King James, right? And what that means is that if we don't put in our own lives, and then as an example for our kids, if we don't put God front and center in our lives, we wonder when our kids grow up why they don't do the same. Maybe it's because they barely know who God is. They can't figure out their way around the Bible because they've never been in it. Okay, for some, kids are the center. For others, kids are a curse. They're expensive. They're time-consuming. They're messy. This is, the, uh, by and large, the Seattleite view. Aziz Ansari, a famous uh, comedian who uh, probably well-known for Parks and Rec, uh, in one of his stand-up comedy specials, he has this little bit about a friend who tells him that uh, they had a baby, and he's like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that happen to you. Oh, man, you're going to have to take care of that thing now forever. I'll talk to you later because I'm going to go do literally whatever I want because all my options are still options. <laughs> kids are not God, and kids are also not gross. They're a gift to be managed for a short time. So let me give you a couple of quick reminders on how to manage this gift, all right? 
You'll find there's a lot of books that are really helpful on this, but they typically break down kids into these, these different maturing stages. And if they're a gift that God's given us to manage, to steward well, we ought to be very careful about how we're doing that. The first is years one through five they call the discipline years. The points that as parents, to be a good faithful steward, we need to take responsibility. Scripture says we're to be fruitful and multiply. That doesn't mean just have kids. Then you have like 14 little demons running around. That means to train them. Be fruitful and multiply. Fruitfulness is not just number, it's depth, it's character. And then we also need to discipline them. God gently and firmly disciplines us. He disciplines for disobedience, dishonesty, disrespect. We don't discipline on accident. We don't discipline in anger. But kids are, they need to be channeled. They need to be corrected. They need to be trained. That's fundamental to what it means to be a parent. And for some strange reason, which I understand there's been authoritarian, especially in the greatest generation of World War II, when the dads got back and families started, there was a very disciplinary uh, strain that ran through a lot of parenting. But the irony is that the flip side has happened, where now it's become all about, about kids self-actualizing. And the only problem with that is the scripture that says to raise up your kids in the way that they should go. That means you have to engage. You have to do something. And then also in this stage, they say to stay consistent. Stay consistent. I love Galatians 6, 9. It says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at a proper time we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. So if you're here this morning, your mom that's been changing diapers, staying up really late, feeling like this is completely thankless and ridiculous, here's what I would tell you, and it's so true and so important. The days are long, but the years are short. You will blink, and, and all of a sudden they'll be in high school. What you do now matters. You're shaping it as wet concrete, and what you do will have an impact for the rest of their lives. Next stage, the training years. These are years 5 through 12. They say uh, to raise the expectations. In this stage, parents, you are to raise the expectations for your kids. It's interesting, in Jewish culture, you were an adult at age 12. This was it. 5 through 12 was your last time of being a kid. And at age 12, a young Jewish boy or girl would have most of the scriptures memorized. What expectations do we have for our kids? Not crushing, overbearing expectations, but expectations that they can and will and are equipped to rise to the level of adulthood. And then we are to train them up in the way they should go. From 5 to 12, here's what's super important for parents. I would call you this. Practice a time of family devotions. I've seen over and over and over again the kids that make it through high school and young adulthood and actually love and follow the Lord. One of the, the interesting dynamics that I usually ask them is, did your family ever practice a time where outside of church and outside of youth group, you actually were in the Bible together? And almost assuredly, they say yes. And if you're like me and you're like, well, what does that mean? And what should that look like? And how long is that? How does that work? And like, I don't want you to have this romanticized version of family devotions. Like, come here, sit, children. And everyone just sits down gently with their hands in their lap. And they're like, yes, Father, I receive. And now I will articulate that back. And like, it's just a zoo, right? They're climbing all over you and blah, blah, blah. And you know what? But more is caught than taught. So open the word. Open the word and try and then there's the coaching years from ages 12 through 18. Scripture says that children are a heritage from the Lord and uh, a, they are a reward for those who love Him. Here's the thing, by, 18, or by 12 to 18, uh, you have had to move through the discipline stage. And if you have not disciplined yet, or rather, sorry, you, you have to move from a discipline stage to a coaching stage. So you have to take a step back at this point. They're becoming a teenager and a young adult. They're finishing, figuring out life for themselves. So discipline had to happen before. This is not the time to swoop in and have it happen now. That little young man is now bigger and taller and stronger than you are. It's not a good time to start disciplining. And this time, the goal is to set the example. The goal is to set the example and allow your kids to watch and learn from you. And then finally, to be a good and faithful steward of the blessing of children um, by 18 and, and over. These are what uh, many and parents and grandparents of older kids consider to be the friendship years. 
right? So, you know, oftentimes people will say, um, oh, you know, my little kid is my best friend. They're not your best friend. You are their parent. The goal is that you would parent and train them in a way that when they become an adult, they can be your best friend. So not yet. So these are the friendship years. And the, the last thing I would say is that the whole goal of being a good steward is that you are building a legacy. You are building a legacy. And one of, my, one of the most beautiful pictures of this, many of you may know of Jonathan Edwards. John, Jonathan and Sarah Edwards um, were a, he was a very influential um, pastor. Um, many of you might be familiar with the, the Great Awakenings in early uh, America. And what was interesting is Jonathan and Sarah Edwards would daily pray for five generations of their kids. So they would be praying for generations that are, are not yet even born yet. Thinking in legacy terms, thinking not just about their life and not even just about their kids' lives, but of the lives of those who are to come. And what's interesting is that there was a study done about the Edwards family and the direct descendants included one vice president, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 65 college professors, 80 public office holders, and 100 missionaries, all from one godly couple that spent a little time each day praying for five generations yet to come. And I, I tell you what, I come from a very broken family, maybe like some of you. I come from a family that's full of addicts, whether it was alcohol or gambling or sex. I come from a family where we can't even really trace our family line back because it's so broken and convoluted and all over the place. And my prayer is that this would be not just our heart and not just in our mind, but would get down into our bones and become the culture of our church and the culture of our families. That these little kids here who are being so gracious and kind and quiet considering their age, and most of the stuff I'm saying, they probably, you know, might be way over their heads. But here's the thing. My hope is that they are planted in the kind of soil, the kind of culture that is going to raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And that their kids and their kids and their kids and their kids for generations out until the Lord returns will be blessed because of what we did in our season, in our 40, 60, 80 years, however long the Lord would give us. So let's commit covenant together to be good stewards of our marriages, of our singleness, and of our kids. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for all the incredible, wonderful gifts you give us. Lord, forgive us for the ways that we get grumpy and complain. Forgive us for the ways that we're really quick to be unsatisfied, to be ungrateful. Lord, we recognize that the place, the stage, the people you have in our lives are exactly where you want us right now. You are sovereign and in control. And the things that we have are blessings from you. So God, help us to be good stewards, Lord. You've lended them to us for a short season. God, may we return them in better condition <laughs> than how we found them. Lord, I pray for the marriages in this room. Strengthen and protect them. I pray for the singles, Lord. Strengthen and protect them. And we pray for the kids in this room, Lord. Would you be raising up a generation, God, mightier than us, wiser than us, bolder than us. May they make a massive splash all around this world for your glory and the good of others, Lord. May we advance your kingdom, God. Help us to pray for five generations out, Lord. And may what's done in this place create a legacy for the generations to come. We ask this in Jesus' name. All God's people said.